What's up guys, in this video, what I wanna do is show you the top eight transformations that you need to know to graph a quadratic. Now, a lot of times when we're doing some math problems, we need to know how to quickly graph a quadratic. So if we don't know how to graph a quadratic and we have to rely on like using a table of values or, you know, kind of trying to figure out like vertex form and like all the transformations, sometimes it can get pretty quickly. So what I wanna do is just do a quick little review of exactly what you need to know, the quick little transformations, so therefore you can apply them to a quadratic. But before we do that, we just have to make sure that we're on the same page, exactly what we're looking at when we're dealing with a quadratic. So here is a X and Y axis, all right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to draw Y is equal to an X squared, okay? So that graph is going to have what we call the vertex at zero, zero. And again, the, the quadratic is gonna be a parabola or what a lot of times we call like the U-shaped graph. Now to find the next two points or to find the next point, you can go over one, up one. And then to find the next point, you can go over two, up four, one, two, three, four. Now, the cool thing about a quadratic is we have an axis of symmetry. So if you know what two points are to the right of the axis of symmetry, you can reflect those two points on the left-hand side and get the exact same graph. Now, you might say, and a lot of times my students would always ask, well, how do you know the points one, one, and two, four are on that graph? Like, how did you know that? Well, that's why you can relate to the table of values. Now, again, I'm only going to use the table of values so you can see where these points came from. And then for the rest, and for the rest of the graphs we're going to do, I'm actually just going to show you like how to apply, it, how to quickly go ahead and graph it. So let's go ahead and you know let's set up a table of values. Let's pretend we're I don't know back in the day, first learning how to graph, and we know that table of values are really really helpful. So when we're plugging the table of values, what we're going to do is choose a value for x, and then we're going to plug that into the equation and find y. So if we have zero for x, plug zero in for x, and zero squared is going to be a zero. When I plug in one in for x, one squared is going to be a one. And when I plug in a two, when I plug in two in for x, two squared is going to equal a four. Now you can keep on going on and on and on. You could also go to negative numbers. But again, like that's what's nice about knowing the axis symmetry. Like if you know what's on one side of the axis symmetry, you can now flip it over. But that's why like negative one, what's negative one squared? It's positive one. What's negative two squared? It's four, right? So hopefully you can see how that works. All right, so let's just kind of go through these main graphs or transformations that I think every student needs to know. And actually, before I get to that, one last thing I forgot to mention is this vertex you can see here is at zero, zero. This is what we call the parent graph. But what we're gonna do is apply some transformations. And when we're talking about transformations, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add, subtract, and multiply some numbers to this equation, y equals x squared. Now, the form that we're gonna take in that is gonna be y is equal to a times an x minus h quantity squared plus k. Okay, so our h and my k is actually going to be what the um, what the values are for my vertex, and my a is going to be a value that we're actually multiplying this by. All right, so let's go and see how that's going to impact it, and how we can quickly remember what these transformations are going to be. So the first example, the first equation I want to do is just y equals a negative x squared. So when we're looking at this one, one thing I want you to always remember, and a lot of students actually have a pretty easy time remembering it, is when a is when a is negative the graph now opens down. Now, why does that work? Well, for look back at this table of values. Like when I plug in one, right, and I get a one squared, which is one, but then it's gonna be multiplied by a negative one. So it's gonna now be a negative one, right? Um, when you plug in two, you two squared is gonna be four, but now four multiplied by negative one is a negative four. So all what's happening in these, these points, instead of going up, they're now going down because you're gonna have your negative values. Now, the important thing though, is the shape of this graph though is not going to change, right? Remember when we were, remember when I was first talking about like this over one um, up one and over two up two? Now you're just going to do over one down one and over two down four. One, two, three, four. Then going, you could go to like threes if you really wanted to. But again, now we just use the axis symmetry and then I'll try to do my best to graph it. But you can see here, oops, let's see, come on. Oh, I was holding on. A, no. But you can see here, I'm not the best here at graphing from on there, but you can see now it's this upward down parabola. Well, what about if we like take a number and add it to it? Like what if I have y is equal to a x squared plus one? Like what is that doing to the graph? So again, go back to this table of values. You plug in a one, right? You square it, you get two. Or, I'm sorry, you square it, you get one. And then you add one, now you get two. Or take two, two squared is four, plus one is five. So what's happening? Now the, y, the x values are exactly the same, right? Even when you plug in zero, zero squared is zero plus one. So if you think about that, if you're like plugging in zero, zero squared is zero, and then add one, so now that point is being shifted up one. So when you add a number outside of the x squared, which we call our function, what's happening is this graph is actually being shifted up one. 
And that actually makes sense a little bit if you think about what the vertex is. So we tug zero is one. Now when I plugged in one, one squared is one, up one is going to be two. And then over two, then you can go from, from your vertex, you can go over two up four. One, two, one, two, three, four, right? You can do that from your vertex because the shape of the graph is still gonna remain the same. And then I can just reflect it over here and you can kind of see the shape of this graph and how it's going to look. Okay, so what happens here is when you are adding a number outside of the function, that's gonna shift the graph up one, which again, like makes sense, guys, right? Because think about this, what is my K in this case? K is equal to one, right? The vertex is, I don't know why I wrote it like that. The vertex is zero comma one. If you were to think about this in your vertex form, there is no H, there is no adding and subtracting to H, it's just a one on the outside. So therefore it's gonna be a shifted up one. Now, what that's nice about that is if I have then, y is equal to a x squared minus two, then I know, oh, I can do this really quickly. That's just gonna take my graph, The that's just gonna take the exact same graph, and instead of shifting it up one, I'm now going to shift it down two. Like, okay, the shape of the graph is remaining the same, right? But now the vertex is zero comma negative two. I'm still gonna go over one, up one, over one, up one, and then over two, up four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so hopefully you can see like, oh, like, all right, that's kind of making it a little bit easy. Kind of, kind of making some sense here. So then what about then if we add and subtract inside the function? So let's say I have something like this. Um, y is equal to ax minus two quantity squared. So we know that when, when you're adding or subtracting outside the function, that's shifting the graph up or down. So I'm hoping and assuming you can follow the logic here that went with me. If I'm adding and subtracting inside of the function, see how this is inside the parentheses that's being squared? that's gonna shift the graph left or right. And if you're making that assumption, then you're absolutely correct. But sometimes using a table of graph can be a little bit confusing and I can go down that route, but again, I want this to be a little bit quick. So what I want you to do is understand this is, well, if I know the vertex, if I know this changes my vertex, if this is the K of my vertex, like going back to here, this is my K, right? So what that means is this is going to be my H. Now, what I always like students to do though, is I like to rewrite this as a two in parentheses, because I, what I want you to understand is H is equal to two. And the reason why that is so important is because remember, H represents the vertex. The vertex is not negative two. We're not shifting the graph two units to the left. That's what a lot of students want to do. But this is not shifted two units to the left. This is shifted two units to the right. And again, that is because my H is a positive two. So I'm gonna go over two units, and then from here, I can go up one over one, up one over one, and just because for the sake of space, I'm just gonna leave it from on there. So when you have an X minus two, that's actually shifting it two units to the left. So then maybe you might be thinking, well, does that mean then X plus two is shifted, or let's say X plus three is going to be three units to the left? And yes, you're right. So why don't we look at a X plus three, quantity squared. Why is this to the left? Why is my H a negative three? Well, again, it all comes into writing it in this form. And if you can write it in this form, it's gonna look something like this. Y is equal to a X minus a negative three. Wouldn't you agree that minus a negative three is the same thing as plus three? So if it is, which it is, then you can write it like this. This is just the simplified form. But what I want you to see then is H is equal to a negative three. So again, the, the quadratic has not been shifted up or down. We're not multiplying it by a negative, right? So it's still gonna be opening up. It's now just gonna be shifted three units to the left. So what I'll do here is I'll just take this and say, all right, now let's just go from here. And then again, here's my vertex, right? Three units to the left, negative three comma zero. But now I'm gonna go over one, up one, over one, up one, because that is the pattern of the quadratics that I want you to know. And let's write this vertex here, right? Two comma zero, having fun. All right, so that's kind of fun with like the transformations. And we talked about the negative, which I think is like pretty basic. But one thing that also kind of gets students is going to be, what about when we have our scalar? So what about if I did like y is equal to a two x squared? What is that gonna do to the graph? Now let's go back to our original table because I kept the table pretty simple or pretty basic for a reason. And if you look at this table, whatever you plug in for x, that's what you're gonna get for y. Then we're gonna multiply it by that scalar, which in this next problem is multiplying it by two. So when you plug in zero, you get zero, then multiply by two is still zero. When you plug in a one, you get one, right? And then multiply by two, you now get a two. When you plug in a two, and you get four. Now multiply by two, you're just gonna get an eight, okay? So let's go and see what this graph is now gonna look like if, if we did something like that. And I think I have enough room. Let's do, yeah, we can, we'll do enough room. So 
if you remember what I have here, if I plug in zero, I get zero, zero squared, right? Times two is still zero. When you plug in a one, one squared is gonna be one times two. So over one, up two. Now remember the previous relationship was over one, up one, over one, up one, right? When you're not multiplied by a number, it's, it's, it's commonplace, over one, up one, over one, up one, over two, up four, right? <laughs> you, don't, you don't want those like two points on one side and then you can flip it over. But notice when you have a number in front of that X squared, what's happening is you gotta multiply that number times whatever you get for that X squared. So when I had, when I plugged in a one, I got one, but multiplied by two gives me a two. What happens when I plug in a two? Two squared is going to be a four. So remember it was supposed to be over two, up four, right? Up two, up four, one, two, three, four, right? That's supposed to go to there. But now when I get a four, I multiply by two, it's gonna be up eight. So one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's like, whoa, what's happening here, right? And you're like, holy crap, this is a really, really skinny parabola. And that's exactly what happens with that two. That two vertically stretches our graph, okay? So whenever you see a two, just make sure you're multiplying it by a value that you'd plug in for x squared. Now, typically when that, um, whenever that number is larger than one, it's, you know, it's relatively simple. You, it's kind of easy to really do that because especially if you have one, like one squared is usually always going to be one multiplied by two, it, you know, it's very basic. But what about if you had a number that was a little bit more tricky? Like what if I had a one third X squared? What is that going to do to the graph? Well, again, let's kind of use some logic. If multiplying by a number larger than one vertically stretches the graph, then multiplying by a number less than one, but not negative between, you know, one and zero, that is going to be vertically compressing the graph. And again, you can kind of see like how that's going to work, right? Like if I took a, um, let's go and, you know, plug in a graph here. Look, plug is zero. Zero squared is zero times one third is still zero, right? So the graph's not shifting left to right. But what if I plugged in a one? One squared is one, so that's gonna be a one third. Really, really short, right? And let's do two. Two squared is four. Now four times one third is going to be a four thirds, which is really one and one third, all right? And then what about if I did a three? Three squared is going to be a nine. Nine times one third is three. So at three, one, two, three, I got one, two, three. So you can see that this graph is eventually sharing the same like pattern that we had, but you can see that's taking a much wider course than when you're multiplying by a scalar larger than one, or than just our regular graph with no multiplying by scalar at all. Okay. So the one third, anything less than one, but larger than zero is going to be horizontally compressing the graph. It's not a stretch. It's not a horizontal stretch. It's a vertical compression. And the last one I want to have a little fun with, because it's one that we don't really talk about a lot uh, with our students. And uh, I'm not like that. It's not one we really talk a lot with our students, but it's just one I want to kind of enter with you and just to kind of understand, to kind of make, again, that logical connection between our transformation. Because in this one, we actually don't need it. And that's why a lot of times it's not taught. Um, but if you remember, when we were talking about the reflection, when I multiplied by negative outside, that reflected about the um, x-axis, right? You can see how the graph got flipped about the x-axis. So what about if I multiply by negative inside the function? Remember how we talked about the differences of the transformation? You know, inside is shifting it left or right. That's a horizontal transformation. When you add or subtract outside the function, that is a vertical transformation. That's shifting it vertically. So when I multiply by negative, that was a vertical reflection. So what happens if I multiply by negative inside? That's a horizontal reflection. Well, what would the graph look like if you horizontally reflected about the y-axis, right? What if I took this graph and flipped it across the y-axis? What would the graph look like? And the answer is it's going to look exactly the same. So it still is a transformation that's going on. You still want to make sure you know what that you can label the transformation. But in the case of a quadratic, since it is already reflective about the y e um, about the y-axis, this transformation is going to is going to produce our exact same original equation. So up to one, two, three, four, there. And then we can go from there. Oops. Yeah, put there. There we go. So this is going to produce the exact same graph. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully this video was helpful as a quick little review for transformations of quadratics. And if so, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Cheers.